If I ruled the world, I love them, love them, baby. Welcome to If I Rule the World podcast, episode number 19. We're up to, and we have on the phone right now lead vocalist of War on Women, Shona Potter. Hi, Shona. I love the way you say my name. <laughs> Do you? Is it? Am I wrong, or yeah. you just like the way it did? It, it has to be wrong, then. <laughs> no, no, it's not wrong at all. It's just, I honestly think it's a beautiful accent. Oh, I lo- it's the accent. <laughs> I love it. That's well, what ha- yeah. That's, that's what happens in Long Island. We, we uh, butcher a lot of <laughs> names. And I'll tell you why we're off to a good start, because most people, I've almost never heard, I love your accent. <laughs> yeah, never. I know. Well, they, they uh, well, they're idiots. Honestly, <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not being sarcastic. I, I truly think it's uh, like musical, you know, I love it. Yeah, yeah you're well, doing it with a lot of melody, George. Yeah, it's, it is a rhythm to it. There's, <laughs> a, there's a thing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's actually, you know, um, like Sam said, where we like to get on, get singers on the podcast to interview because Sam and I both are, well, I was in a band, he sings, so we like to sort of uh, powwow with uh, fellow singers. So, uh, you know, you've, you join the club. Yeah, most of us have a lot to say. Most of us are pretty chatty. We do. <laughs> I'm actually not very, like, my, my onstage banter is pretty bad. I just sing and play guitar, though. Um, <laughs> so you guys are based out of um, Baltimore? Yeah. Okay, I, I mean, so War on Women. Can you just tell us a little bit about the band, like, when it started and uh, how it came about, Ashley? Yeah, um, we started in, I guess, 2010. Uh, me and Brooks, uh, who's the male guitar player, we were in another band together before this for years. And so we've been writing songs together for a long time. And we just wanted to do something different. Our whole band was fizzling out. And, um, you know, sometimes the stars align and then um, something happens. And luckily for us, it's been well-received. And, you know, people are responsive to it, which is really cool, and which yeah. is definitely not the reason that we started playing music or even something that we're used to. Um, is, this but, like, is, uh, this, is, yeah. this, is this like the most, like, you know, quote unquote successful band or the band that, that people have noticed the most that you've been in? Yes, definitely. And I've been playing guitar since I was 12, and I've been in bands since I was 14, and I've been touring since I was 16. And I'm in my mid thirties now, you know. So I've done a lot of different things. Um and I I actually lived in Nashville in high school and that was a very like music industry oriented town. So I did have some, you know, run ins with um people that do music for a living, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah, the song uh, which is a totally different thing than like I just want to play a show and DIY and punk and all that. So it's I, I've I've gotten I've I've had a few a few different experiences in my life, a few different vibes going. <laughs> so like the songwriters seem to to have like the, I guess Nashville is known for like songwriters just moving there. Um, it's actually on my bucket list of places to go. I've never been there, and I would like to just one day take a week and bring like an acoustic and do some like open mics like that's what i see in my head like i could be completely not like that but but shauna help me out isn't that the touristy thing to do <laughs> yeah. like right well, like I'll... you live there that's got to be like someone being like in new york city i'm i gotta get to Times square <laughs> i gotta go to bubba gum shrimp you know? like... yeah and i'm gonna do an open mic and i'm gonna be discovered and i'm gonna be famous and it's gonna be awesome yeah, yeah basically I'm gonna be it's not like ignored. the show nashville Although it is a little bit, you know, like all those famous people are there, all those labels and A and R people, they're there. Um, but honestly, now Nashville is gentrified, just like a lot of cities. And so, while it is really beautiful, um, it doesn't quite have like the same grimy. There was a hint of grime to it, like a hint of not even grime, just like kind of real, like. Right that real country vibe is gone. Um, But the cool thing is that when we tour there now, um, it's very easy to eat vegan. And it definitely was not when I lived there. So that's a bonus. Right. Do you still have like friends and family in that area? I do. I do. I get to stay. Actually, whenever we go through town, last couple of times we went through, um, my old bass player from my high school band 
um, has a house with um, a pool. <laughs> and so we try to take an extra day off and like just spend it hanging out in her house. <laughs> a, po- a pool is so crucial on tour. Oh my gosh. And the summer, and we, this last summer, we were on Warp Tour and we had our day off was in Nashville and we could just chill in the pool and drink some coobs and like, you know, <laughs> relax. It was, it was so, it was so great. Yeah. Uh, going back to the band, why do you think, like, out of everything you've done, this is like the most well received band? I think because it has a point of view. Um, and I think that. It well, well, I feel that everything I've done is authentic, you know, like I've, I've definitely never been someone that writes songs so that an audience will like it necessarily. Um, I think that the way we deliver what we're doing, I think it's easier to see the authenticity. Yeah. Um, I, I you know, for whatever reason, I also think it we're just kind of timely. Um, I know I was looking for a band like us and couldn't find it, and so we started one instead, you know? Right. So I, I know what it's like to, to want to hear more, you know, specifically female voices and perspectives, um, but also just hear something that is saying something, to put it um, simply. And I I, th- I was listening to an interview of yours, and you were talking about growing up on Riot Girl music and that, and you did kind of mention you said, but we can be better. Like as far as the sound and be more musical is what I was getting out of, of, of what you were talking about, in particular the sound of the music. Because music with a message, we all grew up in punk rock and hardcore. What's great about it is you can just come out with a message, not necessarily know how to play your instruments, but it still could be something. Yeah. But if you sort of have the both, the the message, that type of attitude, and... A, a great band it, it's sort of uh, a package that that propels it, it it forward and that's sort of what I was getting out of that conversation in your interview that I was listening to yeah I mean well we also have ovaries just for the record um, we don't all have balls so right. <laughs> it doesn't take a body part to have a point of view or be strong right uh, just a heads up but um, but yeah and you know no 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 um uh, insult goo to Riot Girl for quote unquote not being able to play their instruments that well um, because like that was a form of protest at the time. Yeah. Right? If if the men who were wanting to exclude you were like diddly, 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 like musically masturbating all over their instruments and super technically proficient and also misogynist well, one way to say, I don't want any part of that is to just do the opposite, you know, right. and like strip it down and make it really raw and more about like feeling and, and expressing anger um, than anything else. And I think that that was super important. And frankly, a lot of punk is like a lot of punk music that's not specific to women playing or Riot Girl, right? 100%. But I also think that yeah. Riot Girl had a time and a place. And I think it's odd, and I could totally be wrong. <laughs> you know, it's just my opinion, but I, I think it's odd to call music today that is made by women that is also kind of angry. I think it's odd to call it right, girl. Right. Like, that. that's, that's seated in a moment in history for me. Um, and so there's no reason because of my lived experience and, and, like, growing up on Riot Girl and a bunch of other stuff, there's no reason for me to call my band Riot Girl or to want to be in a, quote, Riot Girl band or to just repeat the same things that have been done. We right. we, we purposely wanted to do... We, well, honestly, me and Brooks wanted to marry all of our interests. And we have more interest than just Riot Girl. Obviously, it's very important, very influential. But we're human beings. We're nuanced, yada, yada. So... um yeah, we wanted to be able to express our anger. We wanted to, like, throw back to old influences and hardcore and, like, early Metallica and Thrash and, um, and Eurythmics and the Slits. You know, like, there's, so, a, there's a lot of stuff to be influenced by. Yeah, definitely. There, I, so, wow, that's – because I, I even hear it in the music. 
like especially like on the newer record like there's even like a song like capture the flag i feel like there's so many different twists and turn to that um <laughs> and there's a lot of influence in bit but the songs just like go together super great but so and you gr- got to have kathleen hannah on your record <laughs> i still got my right girl on yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> yeah for all of that for all of that uh, exposition i gave you <laughs> <laughs> how did you how, how did you meet her i mean like she's a legend oh yeah well i i could have met her in a porta potty at riot fest but I kept my mouth shut and I walked outside and I waited for her to be done oh, in the port of honey. That is so and good. then I said, hi, <laughs> I'm Shauna. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, it's one of those, one of those like festival porta potties where there's like four stalls in the same little like trailer thing, right? Like an actual sink in there, like very lavish. Right. <laughs> wow. Um, and I walk out, I literally open the bathroom door, and there she is at the sink, like, going to put on some mascara or something. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. So I left, and I waited outside, calmed down, and I said, hello. <laughs> I like you. I'm, I don't even know what I said. I'm sure I sounded like a total idiot. Um, but that, that's where we met, and we had a little chat. And then um, later on, there would just be a couple tweets back and forth. Thank you, Internet, for existing and allowing us to converse with people you never would otherwise. You know what? The, and that then is... at some point I said, be on my record. Yeah. That, I mean, that the Internet, it, for as many bad things as it can be, like you can do something like that. You know, mm-hmm. you're, we're so connected and you can <laughs> – it can happen. And like you said, there, there she is, like on the record. Yeah, it's a pretty great equalizer, whether that's – you know, good sometimes, bad sometimes. Like the the cover of, of War on Women, like the, the self-titled, like, I'm just curious. First of all, actually, how did how'd you even come up with the, with the name? Of the self-titled record? Oh, no, I'm saying like, how'd you come up with the, the name of the, I was, I was thinking of the cover. <laughs> Jumped. I was thinking of the cover. And then I was thinking, because it's, it seems to me like it's a factory and there's babies coming out of it. I could be completely. Yeah, their okay. nickname is definitely Baby Factory. Yeah. Okay. And then it got me thinking, I'm like, let's just go back and just ask you how the name even came about. Because it's, it's definitely a, a name that, that will catch you. Yeah, it, um, that's what we were hoping. We were hoping it would be obvious to people um, what we're about, or at least make them stop and wonder. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I think at the time when we were thinking about ideas and what we wanted to do uh, in 2010, it was already a phrase being used like in online feminist circles. We definitely didn't invent the term war on women, but I don't think it was quite as mainstream then as it is now, even in the short time. Um, but yeah, we wanted it to be up front and let you know what we're about. And there's a song on there um, that's pretty interesting, uh, YouTube comments. Uh, did you actually read... Uh, the YouTube comments on any of the videos uh, on the clips for the lyrics. Uh, yeah, yeah, those are directly listed. Yeah, it's, um, it seemed comments. it seemed very like <laughs> it seemed you're like, like recognize you're like oh yeah yeah because I'm thinking yeah. like you know the YouTube comments are like a cesspool <laughs> more than any other <laughs> cesspool ever. I think they're like I don't know what it is. There's something about YouTube comments and maybe Channel Twelve, which is local to us. But like, yeah, as, as I'm listening to the lyrics, I'm just thinking like, wow, that's it has to be actual things that Sean is reading. <laughs> yeah, I didn't write. I, I technically didn't write any of the lyrics to that song. <laughs> that, that is even the chorus, right? Even the chorus. Yeah, uh, the chorus. Yeah, the chorus sticks very well. So I wanted to get into a little bit of the, the, the things you do um, besides the band. You, you, you play the set. It doesn't seem like the work ends there because you do a lot of stuff of working with venues and also, you know, the, with the group that you're with, Holla Back. And I know you just wrote a book, too, working with venues, yeah. which I believe just came out. Can you talk about that a little bit, that stuff we do in Bystander Intervention? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're covering it. Um, I I basically bring my knowledge uh, as a person in the band, as a person that's been in a lot of clubs over two decades in various roles, uh, as someone who kind of runs a small business. Um, I I bring all that stuff and merge it with basic bystander intervention skills 
and, um, you know, anti-sexism work and, and, and all of that. And, and I teach people who, who want to be taught, <laughs> um, how they can use those bystander skills in their specific setting in, in a venue, in a club, in a bar, in a, you know, art gallery, like whatever. Um, cause I think that, that, that having, you know, when you work in one of those places where it's not like a big corporate job, right? There's no like HR, there's no like, you know, necessarily like legal team hovering over you to make sure you do one thing or the other or say this, not that. Right. Um, but it's also not the street, literally. It, it, it is a place where you have some sort of authority, but there's no one telling you exactly what to say. So you you have a responsibility to make sure that everyone that comes in the door is comfortable and happy while they spend their money. And and most of the time, people people just want to know what to do. They just don't know what what to say and and all i'm doing is is telling them well you can say this this and this you know Hmm. (laughs) you can do this 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 and and uh just giving them the language to talk about it and you know reminding them that they do have power if if something you know that just doesn't seem right is happening on the floor like they have the power to to deal with it and they they should they owe it to the community to take care of it so just today, I got a package in the mail from AK Press with my my author copies of this pocket like guidebook, and so I am on cloud nine right now very talking cool. to yeah, you. Yeah, very cool. Um, I'm so excited. It is so cute and adorable, and I kind of think it would fit in your pocket if your pocket's a little big. <laughs> it is definitely a pocket size. Um, I got my jet goes on. It's, Cargo there pants. you go. <laughs> we're, we're, we're dudes from the '90s, so yeah. we still wear cargo yeah. pants. Just, yeah. just we're hardcore kids from the '90s. Yeah, so. we'll take two. So you yeah. need like ten copies. I got yeah, ten copies. Know, ten pockets. <laughs> Absolutely. Got it. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just like, I'm just really proud. It took a lot of work, and it, you know, it takes a village. Um, I certainly couldn't have done it without other people's help and influence, and. Um, and all of that, and, and and really, I couldn't do it without being in a cool town like Baltimore, where there are just so many activists and so many organizations doing great work. So many people that I can learn from, honestly. And I just wanted to share that with people that can't fly me to their town to do one of these trainings. Right. You know, so this this has a lot of the tips that I normally tell people when I do a training. And and then next year, a a more full length version, like an actual book uh, of the same same subject matter, will come out. So it'll just have more information in it, more personal stories, um, more examples, stuff like that. So the expanded version will be out next year. But but it was really important to me to get this pocket guide out as soon as possible. Um, especially in light of the Me Too movement blowing up, because I I just felt like people were hungry for this knowledge. They want they want to know what to do. Most people are good, and they just want to know how they can help. And and this is a way you can help. Just read this book and do what it says. You know, it, it's interesting. I wanted to I want to tell you a little story about something that sort of happened around the conversation of doing this interview with you. Um, mm. like you said, most people are good. And I was talking about, there's a third person that helps us with this podcast. Her name is Mariko. And she does a lot of the uh, website stuff for us. And she helps us. I was with her last week. And I was talking to her about this interview and the ideas. And we were going back and forth. And, you know, I'm 45. I grew up in the hardcore scene. And I feel like I'm clued in. And when I was talking to her about this, she sort of launched into stories about what she grew up dealing with in the scene. In my mm-hmm. mind, I felt like it's a safe place. When I was a kid going to hardcore shows, I was a young boy worried about getting my own ass kicked. And I didn't yeah. really think about women and and what it was like because somewhere around mid nineties, somewhere like later nineties, the violence of the the gangs at CBGB's and stuff like that stopped. There wasn't those fights. So it almost felt like a relief. There was like ABC, no Rio and things. And I just sort of like, didn't think about it 
like, yeah, everybody's safe now because we're not worried about getting our asses kicked. <laughs> right. She told me this, all this stuff, and she's Japanese as well, so she was telling me even some stuff having to deal with that and racial comments. And I was like, Shona, I'm like, I had no idea. Like, no idea. Yeah. And it was kind of a moment. It was it was interesting because just 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 this conversation, you know, like, and, and it it comes from a place of, uh, you know, not you know, just it's the definition of ignorance. Like, yeah, did not know. And, and, and <laughs> a know? lot of people are that way too. Like I hear it, and and it's like if they don't good go- people not shutting it yeah. out like oh it doesn't exist oh, no, but no. just didn't really you're in your own mindset you're you're worried about your own things yeah. you're in a band or you, you, you know when we were kids we just didn't want to get our asses kicked as a guy and you figured girls were okay because if somebody puts their hands in there they'll probably get beat up but her whole thing explanation i thought was just really 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 eye-opening to be no honest. it's it's true you it's not your fault you can't know what you don't know right like and, and that definitely goes for all of us. But I think that speaks to the fact that um, we probably all could open up our circles of influence a little bit more. Because if we did, and we, we, we present ourselves as someone who's trustworthy, I guarantee you would have, you would have been hearing those stories when they were happening. Right. You know? Like, it's not like all of a sudden women are dealing with harassment like we always are and we always have been and we've always been talking about it we've just been talking about it to people that we trust enough with our stories that they won't go oh come on oh you're overreacting oh it's just a joke oh that's not real he didn't say that well i he's always been a nice guy to me right you know all that stuff um and once we shed all that defensive stuff and, and just listen to people it it's very easy to realize you know not everyone lives in the same town even though they're physically in the same town, right? right? It's just a different place for some people. And that's actually how Hollow Back got started, the organization that I, that I volunteer for, that I, the, the chapter that I founded here in Baltimore. It's an anti-street harassment organization. Um, but that's how it got started. It was a group of men and women talking about their experiences in New York City, realizing that, oh, the men just didn't think about the same stuff when right. walking down the street as the women did, you know? And hey, we all we all have problems. We all have struggles, um, you know. Um, but this is just you know dealing with gender based violence. Obviously, only people that are not like straight cisgender men deal with that, and we're gonna all have to deal with it in um, you know in different ways. And so we we need everyone to just sort of first just believe us. And then the biggest thing to do is that when you see something that's a little, you know, not cool, is just to say, hey, that's not cool. <laughs> and it can be that simple sometimes. Yeah, and you, you sort of so attack good. it from both ends because you really are doing the the band stuff, which is sometimes has to be uh, offense, like attack, and you you are that way lyrically and, and probably in between songs or whatever. But then there's the follow-up with here's information. I know you're coming from a different world. We have uh, information for people who want to be allies and and bystander and intervention, but also even if you're not going to go that far, here's a book you can read. There's a you know th- there's a difference of of sort of like yelling at someone and walking away, as opposed to what you do, which is actually give information. It's a compassionate way, as a compassionate. I ha- I never thought about it like that. That's you're totally right. <laughs> it's full circle. Oh my gosh, you really put that in the word for me. Um, I could be your attorney no, like, if you need it. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll work on the bar. I'll get the bar done by the end of this summer. No, it's it's tr- like, you know, the, the band sort of serves a couple functions, right? Like, one, it, it's just cathartic for me. Like, I, these are things I need to get out and I need to say, like, and I'm pissed about stuff, right? And then it's also something that, you know, maybe someone that goes through the same kinds of things, something cathartic for them to listen to. Yeah. I put something into words for them, made it a little easier and something to shake their fist to. And it also can be like, oh, and by the way, fuck you, <laughs> to harassers or abusers, right? Um, and even, even a, yeah, a lesson um, to some folks if they're just not getting it. But, but I am an ally to marginalized people as well. You know, I'm, I, I'm a woman, but I'm also white. I'm cisgender. I'm able-bodied. I'm a... I was born in the States. I have American citizenship. Um, 
and I'm not religious, and so I'm not I'm not persecuted or oppressed for many things. It's it's really just the whole like I'm a lady thing, and so I'm an ally to other folks, and and. I am not the kind of person that enjoys just being yelled at and told I did something wrong <laughs> and right. I'm not a good enough ally and here's why. Um, I like a little, I like a kind, a kind gesture, a, a, hey, maybe you could do this next time, you know? Um, and so I think it's important to sometimes be yelled at when you really fuck up. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. Like, we got to deal with that. But when you just kind of don't know what to do and you, you, your intentions are good and you're just kind of making maybe even little missteps because you don't know any better, hey, let's, here's a gentle guide. Put you in the right direction because I know, I know you can do it. I know you want to and I know your heart's in the right place. Yeah, and people react to different things. I mean, you, there's nothing better than a well-placed go fuck yourself. That's true. <laughs> there's nothing better than a good <laughs> fuck you. But on the other side, information you know having your mind changed going like sometimes pedo videos might turn someone off because it's just like what i don't get it that you can't and that person isn't spoken to in that way they they, they can't see it but something well, else you know, information will 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 might change someone so it, it, it you know the approach is you know you have sort of a full circle approach to yeah what, what i always think of is, is is what what's the main goal like what's the actual goal it's not to have a band that's popular. It's it's to it's to make violence less common. It's to have a less violent world. And so if that's my true goal, like I have I have to I can't like hoard the information I've learned on how to do that. I have to share it. It has to get out there and and everyone that I share it with has to share it with everyone they know. That's, that's and so great, yeah, great point. as a yeah, so you can say fuck you and then you can can immediately say, Now read this damn book and let's do this together. Let's work together on this. I'm a big fan of second chances, just on anything really. You know, I'm an ex junkie, drug addict, like, you know, I've been clean for like nineteen years. So um Congratulations. Yeah, I just I'm a, I'm a big fan of second chances because you know, people change and as long as, uh, they're repentful or, you know, they're, they're sorry for whatever they did and they see, you know, they talk to someone like you or, or anyone that, that has a good head on their shoulders and shows them a different way. That's, that's great. Just out of curiosity. So you said you played warp tour, just wondering how, like, there's a lot of young kids that go there. Like how w- were they receptive to like your message? Um, <laughs> I, I put this in like a written interview the other day and it's like kind of all I've been thinking about is oh. that is that statistically most people that attended Warp Tour didn't see us. You know? Okay. Like, it's a big festival. There are a ton of bands. What year was um, it? I'm sorry. Just this last year, last summer. Okay. So, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to distract you, a lot of things to keep you busy. It can be really hot, it can be raining. Um, and there are definitely way bigger bands than us, uh, on the tour. And so if people weren't interested in us already, it, it wasn't that common for them to find themselves in front of our stage. Yeah. Like not, not in like a hundreds of thousands or whatever. <laughs> um, but people walking by, I would, I would, I would do my best to, to hold their attention and keep them there for like a song. Which is which is honestly, I think, still a big deal considering how much goes on at Warped Tour. Um, if they don't already know you, and and normally we did it, we held their attention, we kept them kept them watching, kept them listening, um, the song and is- that was always really cool. So some people would come to see us, of course, and then some people were there to make sure you know their kid didn't break their neck, and then I'd get like I talked to like cool dads that like didn't expect to see us and bought a shirt and a hat you know like it was it was pretty pretty awesome actually so it was a good experience overall i would yeah yeah i I would imagine like it's just great exposure regardless so and i you know now that it's like the last one especially it's such a like legendary um regardless of where it is now or you know a few years ago it just seems you know uh, a part of like almost like americana at this point like a Lollapalooza or something you know yeah, we feel very grateful that we were allowed to be part of this 
Warp Tour story, honestly. I could keep you on the phone forever. We don't want to do that. <laughs> but I do want to touch on something we sort of brought up in the beginning of the episode, which is about, you know, uh, you got three vocalists on the phone. And an aspect of that is being a front person. And Sam and I talk about this stuff all the time. We always like to talk to other singers about that. And I'm curious what it's like for you because you do have such a political message. And sometimes the word political isn't even good. It's like music with a message. And when you're on stage, you have, you're, you're making a point. And you're making a point with your lyrics. And language is messy. Like, it's difficult. It's difficult to, mm-hmm. to sort of get your message out and everybody get it in the right way. And I was uh, lis- listening to an- another interview of yours and you were talking about a moment you had where you kind of, and I'm paraphrasing, I think you were paraphrasing in the interview, you said, um, you know, femmes up to the front. And you made a really great point. Like, let's give a space to, or you take a space that you don't normally get. And then there was people who felt offended because they were transgender but they identified a little bit more on the masculine side and they sort of felt bad and then you had a moment where you're like well now I feel bad that they feel bad and I wonder (laughs) what that's like the weight of how you put that together how you deal with that where maybe my old bands and maybe Sam's bands we, we don't have that same thing we can say something flippant and move on it's a little different yeah right you when you when you when you put yourself out there as a political band or a feminist band, you are vulnerable to people's critiques as to whether or not you are a good enough political band, a good enough feminist band. And I totally get that. Mm-hmm. And I try to think of it in the in the the most positive way I can, even if you know I might have moments of frustration or don't they know exactly what I mean? It's like, of course they don't. And that's fine. Um, So I I try to look at it in in a way that it's it's just an opportunity to grow and learn something. Um, And I can, you know, kind of poor baby myself for a minute. And then I got to get back to work. I got to get back to the work of being the best ally and the best feminist I can be. And that means just considering other people. And, and considering their stories and believing them. So so it sucks when, when, when that happens, if I kind of, you know, misstep and say something that isn't perfect. Um, but I try to just acknowledge that I'm human and that's going to happen. It's going to keep happening because sure. I'm a human being. All I can do is just keep trying to do my best. And, and when I face criticism, instead of being like, whatever, you know, and not listening, I try to listen and, and take it in and, and in a way that is, you know, makes sense and is reasonable. Um, and that's what this whole, that's the, the, the stuff you're talking about. Like, that's what ended up happening. Right. And I, I apologize for my part in it and, and for, for hurting anyone and kind of tried to explain my intentions, but also explain what I learned and what I'll do different. And, and then it was over, you know, right. and that's, that's the way it should be. And I, and I didn't say that stuff or commit to doing anything that I wasn't going to do or, you know, I wasn't just trying to hold people off or make them shut up. Like, it was, it was as genuine as anything else I do on stage or in lyrics. So, and then, and then that was it. And, and I, you know, it, it did confirm something for me that, like, you know, not all women are feminine and not all non-binary people are feminine and I don't want to exclude anyone that identifies as butch or non-binary or a masculine who has still dealt with some form of gender-based harassment and violence. Like that wasn't the point of saying femmes to the front. Right. That's not why I'm saying that. I'm saying that because I literally want people that don't normally get to take up space. I want them to take up space and I want everyone else to give up some space at our shows and and just and equalize it and that that's all it is it's like equaling the playing um the playing field right so right. so if that's the point then i can just say it like that instead of making it more about gender presentation um or or even identity yeah I, that's good I, I, the way you the way you look at it is is really positive 
I think I think it's it's maybe hard for people to understand because there is a bit of a dance. They don't know that. Okay, you could get up on stage and just say what you said for ten minutes or say what you said in the <laughs> right, interview. Right. It's that that doesn't necessarily make the best, you know, front person. That would be a great show. You, you you know, you're making a, a like a you know, there's an economy of words sometimes and you do it in lyrics, like we we know. And then you and You're you totally to, right. You know, you have to get up. So I, I, I was just curious about how, how you square that. And I, I get what you're saying now. You, you know, maybe next time you, you, you're figuring just a different way to do it. And I like how you kind of say, and moving on. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you can't dwell on yeah, it Yeah, I can't. And that's great. Yeah, that's yeah. the other thing is you, you, ha- you do have to move on. Because then otherwise you're, you're, <laughs> you're in guilt. You're, you're wallowing in guilt or something or feeling bad or... And, and that's just a waste of time. And, and I, I, I do encourage anyone if they're called out or called in for something to just sit with it for a while before defending yourself or being like, you're wrong about me or whatever. Like, like see what about it is true. Right. See what you can do to, to change it or, or get, you know, improve yourself or improve the way someone receives you. Like you don't want to, to hurt anyone on purpose, you know? So what, what could you do differently? And, and while it's a really healthy and positive way to look at it, like I certainly didn't feel that way the first time I heard someone complain about it because yeah, I am course. human. Yeah. Um, but you gotta, you know, you gotta work it out for yourself. So yeah, as a, it's, it is interesting as a singer. I, I think the thing that I don't do the thing that I, I do every now and again is I will go on a little bit of a, a rant that's a little too long for the set. <laughs> like there's not actually time for me to say all this stuff. And I'll be, and I do that because there is a point I want to make and I feel like it's too nuanced to just say it in a quick little blip, you right, know? Right. And usually after the set, you know, Brooks can just kind of look at me and be like, so, and I'll be like, I know, I know, (laughs) I know, I know that was too long. And I either like have to workshop it on the stage to figure out, okay, well that didn't work. So I need to figure out a better way to say it. Or I just literally have to skip talking about that subject or whatever it is, because I can't without going on a long rant. Um, and so I'm, I'm still finding times where I need to pull back because most of the time, like, I actually don't want to talk in between songs. Mm-hmm. I just want to play the songs. I don't want to. I feel like our lyrics are pretty clear. Um, you can read them on, at your leisure to know what I'm really saying. Um, I don't need to wax poetic and... And, um, and preach to you. I, I don't like doing that. I hate it when bands do it to me. And over the years, I've tried to find a balance right. of, of still connecting with people and giving, giving them a little bit more than just the music. And, and I'm figuring that out. And every now and again, because it's not my natural inclination to speak in between songs, I just go off the deep end a little bit and I go a little too long. But so, listen, sometimes there's nothing better than a well-placed rant. If you could yeah. do a well-placed <laughs> rant so. and a well-placed go fuck yourself, you would be my new favorite band. I mean, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I'll I, work on it. I'll I, keep working on it, guys. I see I see a future in the spoken word maybe 15 years from now. And, like, after the band is, uh, you know, gone, <laughs> you, you, could, uh, you could take, you know— it, it, all, Take a Rollins? Yeah, you could just skip all the songs and just do the in-between song banter. That's it. <laughs> It's Do we still have to set everything. up all the amps and stuff? No, that's for that, it. No, one mic. Okay, few. One bottle of water. One <laughs> there's mic. no, there's no drummer. Yeah. You don't have to listen to the band members. There's no trying to figure Excellent. out a set list. It's all on you. That is the dream. Now, if I you change like it to one singer. bottle of wine, then I'm in. Ah, okay, sure. One bottle of wine. <laughs> We're really on the same page here, <laughs> as that's I'm we, sipping my wine. That's what we have. Quite here. honest. All right. Um. So I just want to just you know plug the show that you're playing. Um, so it's at Amityville Music Hall, which is a local spot for us here. Um, it's under SBC Presents. It's a Saturday afternoon matinee. So there's four bands. Obviously, War on Women is going to be headlining. There's also Old Torn Up, Sister Munich, and Our Buddies, uh, and Outlive Death are opening the show. 
Those are our brothers. Oh, actually, that band is called Sister Munch. Oh, Sister Munch. <laughs> All right, Sister Munch. Sister Munch. Though. Yeah, they're, they're a pretty fun band. Okay. Um, yeah, I suggest everybody come out early. Um, and it's, yeah, what a fun idea to just play some punk in the afternoon, one, not be stressed about having to get home and get ready for work the next day. Oh, 1 p.m., uh, 1 p.m., 16 over, uh, 21 to drink. Uh, yeah, that's it, June June 30th. I'm trying to think of anything else. Ever, I mean, I guess we'll just throw the links on there. We'll so. throw the links on. Uh, Amityville Music Hall, one of the best venues around. It's run by people in the scene. Also, SBC cool. Booking Collective, same thing. You know, yeah. just people that are really trying to. Uh, They've been doing it forever, and, and they're awesome people. Do great things. Give everyone a shot. So we we love them, and we love helping them out. And that brings us to the end of the interview, but we have one more question for you. So the name of the podcast is If I Ruled the World. So we ask all of our guests, we pose that question. If you ruled the world, Shona Potter, what would that look like? Um, it would look like it would look, it would look like free health care <laughs> and free public transportation and free college and university education and um it would it would look like the people that actually make up the world right the people in power the people helping us to make decisions and to be leaders um they would actually reflect who they're leading and and who they're um and who pays their salary with their taxes that that's what it would look like I like it. Sounds like a nice world. Yeah, that's it. I'm in. <laughs> I need some of that health care. If you need a if you need an attorney, Sean. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Sounds good. Damn. It would also be like um it would also mean that you couldn't get a hangover from drinking red wine. I think we should put our best people on that. <laughs> yes. First thing we start. <laughs> I'm literally drinking red wine. He as is. The as, wine as references I, as are coming I drink up. water. Yeah. I feel like a total like white lady stereotype right now. I'm just like obsessed with red wine. Roll, roll with That's it. Terrible. Roll with it. Um, but but for real, um, not everyone drinks. And if someone uh, doesn't accept your drink offer, just take it as a no and leave them alone and don't ask them why over and over again. They might be struggling in ways that you don't understand. So. Um, we'll just end it on that serious note. How about that? <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, stop asking me, George. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for doing this, uh, and look forward to meeting you at the show. And hopefully, everyone else will join us. And that's it. June thirtieth. Thank you very much, Shauna. Thank you so much for having me. Let's high five when we meet on the thirtieth. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, we're gonna air high five right now. That was. <laughs> yeah, we, we I'm it. doing it. Are you doing it? Yes, Absolutely. We did. Yeah. We did. We did. We did. Yes. And, and a whoa, Bundy. All right, cool. Okay. <laughs> whoa, Bundy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all, right, all right, so this is uh, – we're, we're going to – I try to do that all the time, and no one knows what I'm no talking about. I, I I took a leap of faith, and I was like, let me throw a whoa, Bundy in there, and she's awesome. <laughs> so, Dude, I'm with you. Uh, okay. I'm with you. That's, it. That's all I need to know. So definitely, we're going to – As long as you're not members of No Ma'am, then no. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. So. <laughs> Shout out to Griff though. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna click it here and goodbye.
If I ruled the world